People in Massachusetts, and particularly in Boston, had more power of self-government than anyone else in the British Empire. Under the charter of the 1690s, the town meeting could choose delegates to the assembly. The assembly was the legislative power here. The royal governor appointed by the British crown was meant to make sure that Massachusetts was in line with the empire, and for most of the century, it was. But then in the mid-century, things begin to fall apart as the empire tries to assert more power over the colonies and people in Massachusetts used to governing themselves didn't like the new dispensation that they felt was being foisted upon them. And the central issue in this whole dispute is who has the power to govern, the people in the towns of Massachusetts, the people in Boston, or the, peop- or the members of the British Parliament. You see a struggle for political power between the citizens of Boston used to governing themselves and the British Empire eager to extend its rule over this newly emerging imperial system. Big event that happens in 1747 that shows where things are going. This is at the end of what's called King George's War. And one of the great events of that war was the siege of Louisburg, fortress, the Gibraltar of the North Atlantic and Cape Breton. And Governor William Shirley of Massachusetts had orchestrated this campaign using a British naval force to bring Massachusetts militia to besiege this French citadel of the North Atlantic, the most heavily fortified position in the North Atlantic, and Lewisburg had been used to attack merchant ships from Massachusetts. Lewisburg is taken, it's one of the great triumphs of Massachusetts, and then in 1747, after the war, the British government gives Lewisburg back, but that's a story for another day. In the fall of 1747, this is two years after the siege of Lewisburg, the British fleet is in Boston Harbor, and Thomas Knowles, the commodore of this British fleet, realizes that he's about 50 men short and doesn't have enough men to pilot his ships back across the Atlantic. So Commodore Thomas Knowles does what any British commander would do in a situation like this in any British port in the world. He has press gangs go to the merchant ships in Boston Harbor to round up men, able-bodied seamen. These press gangs sent from the British fleet will impress sailors into British service. Impressment or impressing becomes one way to recruit sailors into the British Navy. And under British law, he was perfectly within his rights to do this. The British Navy was not the best place to be. In fact, Uh, Being at sea at all was a dangerous thing, and the British Navy was run through iron discipline. Men were not allowed to speak on the deck. Those who were troublesome would be flogged as an example to others. The food was bad. The pay was practically non-existent. Being at sea at all wasn't any picnic in in the 18th century. Samuel Johnson, the British man of letters, said the only men who go to sea are those who cannot contrive to get themselves into prison. Being at sea is like being in prison with the added possibility of drowning. At least on a merchant ship, you were going to be paid for your service, and you could leave when you wanted to. If you're in the British Navy, you're in for life, and you don't sign up because of the college uh, tuition benefits and other things you may get through military service. You were there because perhaps you had gone into a tavern and someone had bought you a drink, and you didn't realize that person was a recruiting agent, and once you had accepted the king's coin, you were in the king's service. So British sailors, sometimes when they were in a port where there were merchant ships, might take the opportunity to abscond and go on to one of the merchant ships to get out of the service. And in sitting in Boston Harbor in the fall of 1747, Commodore Knowles realized he had lost about 50 or so sailors. So he sent press gangs to the merchant ships in Boston Harbor to round up 50 or so able-bodied sailors so he could get the fleet back across the Atlantic. The next morning, Governor William Shirley was awakened by something really strange, a mob outside the province house. And in the custody of the mob were about seven or eight British officers. Officers weren't staying on their ships in in the port when they were in port, Officers would take the opportunity to rent rent rooms or apartments or stay with friends in town. 
Boston was a small town, and these men, people in town knew where the officers were staying. They heard the news of the press gangs rounding up sailors. In fact, there was a rumor that a couple of men had been killed in the imp- attempt at, at impressment. And the angry mob, actually composed of both men and women, had kidnapped these British officers, brought them to the province house, and now they were demanding that Governor Shirley release the men who had been impressed, or else he would not get these officers back. Now, Shirley was a military man. He was the command, supreme commander of British forces in North America. And here he's confronted by an angry mob who have in their custody a number of British officers. The first thing Shirley did was walk up to the mob. He and his son, they grabbed these British officers. They chastised them for being kidnapped. I mean, what kind of fools are they to put themselves in this position? Brings them back to the safety of the province house, but Shirley still has several hundred really angry people facing him down. And Shirley tells the mob that he will have to go consult with his council. And the council is a body that it was an intermediate body between the assembly and the governor. They were chosen to by the assembly to advise the governor. So Shirley said he would go meet with the council at the townhouse, now the old state house. So Shirley goes to the old state house. He summons the council, and he also puts militia forces on the stairway because the mob also wants to come and discuss this with the council. They get in by breaking the windows and are trying to storm the stairs, but the militia keep them down while Shirley is upstairs meeting with the governor's council. Commodore Knowles also comes to the meeting, and his advice is quite simple. He can teach these people a lesson by shelling the town, and that will certainly placate the mob. Shirley doesn't think that's going to placate the mob, and over the next two weeks, Shirley engages in a negotiation by which Knowles does release some of the men who have been taken. Now, by this time, of course, some members of the mob are going out trying to take boat, long boats from the British fleet, trying to take away their sails, do other things to prevent them from leaving. group brings one of the long boats to the front of the province house and tries to set it on fire as a protest. And Shirley thinks this is kind of funny, A, because they have trouble lighting the fire. I don't know if you've ever tried to burn a ship, a boat that's been sitting in water for a long time. And also because it's not one of the Navy's boats. It's actually a merchant ship boat. They can't burn it in front of the province house, so they take it to Boston Common, where they set it on fire successfully. Shirley does negotiate an end to this. Knowles keeps offering to bombard the town. Shirley knows that Knowles could do that. Knowles could leave. He could leave with these men who are now being held on the British fleet, and Shirley is going to be left with several thousand really angry people whom he's supposed to govern. So Shirley gets Knowles to agree to release some of the deserters. Knowles leaves Boston with his fleet. They're able to make it to New York, where Knowles doesn't have any problem at all impressing citizens into naval service. But this is the last time the British Navy will attempt to impress sailors in Boston. They realize the cost is just too high. This was something of a victory for the citizens of Boston. On the other hand, Governor Shirley realizes they're in a dangerous position because the Lords of Trade in England isn't going to be happy if they cannot enforce law in Massachusetts. So Shirley writes, and he's also afraid that steps might be taken to remove him as governor, or to simply replace the government of Massachusetts entirely if it cannot abide by British law. Shirley writes a very careful letter to the Lords of Trade explaining what had happened. He also doesn't want Commodore Knowles to be the only one reporting, in which he does chastise the people of Boston for this. And he worries about the consequences, because one thing he sees as very dangerous here is the fact that any 10 people, any 10 men, even of the meanest sort, can file a petition for a town meeting, and then whatever that meeting decides will be the law in the town. So he warns the Lords of Trade that something should be done to rein in the democratical nature of the Constitution here in Massachusetts, or else there is going to be big trouble on the horizon, and the big trouble does in fact arrive. 